Hello and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insight from across disciplines. You can be part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collection held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit radcliffe.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Pumla Goboro Madikizela. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce this year Walter Jackson Bade Fellow Pumla Goboro Madikizela, a professor of South African National Research Foundation Chair in Violent History and Transgenerational Trauma at Stellenbosch University. Her research focuses on trauma and in the wake of human rights violation and its intergenerational repercussions. Professor Goboro Madikizela has published extensively on victim and perpetrators of human rights violations and on forgiveness and remorse. Most notably, she is the author of A Human Being Died That Night, A South African Story of Forgiveness, which won the Christopher Award in 2003 and the Alan Parham Prize in 2004. The book details how, as a member of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Professor Goboro Madikizela interviewed Eugene de Kock, the former commander of Apartheid Death Squad in a maximum security prison. Professor Goboro Madikizela is an engaged scholar with interest extending beyond her academic specialty. She has delivered many public lectures, keynote and endowed lectures globally, and her edited books project illustrate her interdisciplinary cooperation around the world. Her latest edited book on Jewish-German dialogue, history, trauma, and shame, engaging the, path, the past through second generation dialogue is an example of her enduring interest in the transformative potential of encounter. She has been interviewed on her work on many media outlets, including NPR's Fresh Air and Talk of the Nation and Democracy Now. Rachel Swans of the New York Times described her award-winning book as the story of an almost unimaginable dialogue, an exploration of evil, innocence, and the gray spaces in between. During her time at Radcliffe, Professor Goboro Madikizela is working on a book entitled Aesthetics of Memory, Narratives of Repair. In the book, she returns to the archive of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, TRC, and asks, how does the current violence in South Africa reflect on the TRC moment of transition? How might we listen to the TRC testimonies in a way that reveals the missed moments of the TRC? In listening to the testimonies that were pre presented at the TRC, how might we read the body as breaking open a different kind of voice, one that points to a more complex view of trauma's return as an ambiguous space that points backward to multiple generation past and forward telescoping a future of traumatic violence. The book will culminate with reflections on remorse and explore ways in which a sense of solidarity and responsible citizenship might be restored through what she terms reparative humanism. And now it is my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Pumla Goboro Madikizela. Thank you, Claudia. I would like to thank the Dean of the Radcliffe Institute, Professor Tomiko Brown Negan, for this great fellowship opportunity. Thank you again to you, Claudia, and to Rebecca Haley, Sharon Bromberg Lim, Nora Dunden, Emmy Montilli, and all your colleagues for managing this platform with such grace and elegance, and always bringing us together as foils for post-webinar reflection and shared conversations about our work. Special thanks to my research partner, Kelsey Chen, for taking our research partnership to the level of being my thinking partner. Kelsey is one of the undergraduate students 
we are privileged to work with under the Radcliffe Fellowship Program, Research Partnership Program. I also want to thank two people who have always been close to my work, giving me amazing insights to enrich my work, and that is Professors Homi Baba and Martha Mino. In this paper, I want to share a few signposts, just markers really, which I hope will give an idea of the direction I am taking for my Radcliffe book projects. In the first part of the paper, I am going to talk about the aesthetics of memory through the lens of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and reflect on a few testimonies and on the process itself and some of the culturally specific moments through which memory was enacted at the Truth Commission. I will then turn the spotlight from the affective moments of the TRC to the ordinariness of everyday South African life and engage a critical reflection on the relevance of transgenerational transmission of trauma as an explanatory framework for understanding the impact of the past in South Africa. In the final section of the paper, I consider the question of repair and why the optimism of national reconciliation, which framed the work of the TRC, no longer rings true. To conclude the presentation, remorse, both as a response to shame and guilt, and as it may be enacted through the imaginary of the arts is explored, although I may not have enough time to engage with this fully. I'm going to start with two short excerpts from award-winning authors whose work is based respectively in Zimbabwe, the US and Israel, Palestine. The first is from Zizi Dangaremga, this mournable body. Quote, Pezi does not know the horrors each person lived through, the kind of violence that not even my aunts have succeeded in running from, that leaps from their bowels onto their tongues again and again, close quotes. The second quote is from Toni Morrison's Beloved. Someday you will be walking down the road and you hear something or see something going on so clear and you think it's you thinking it up. But it's when you bump into a re-memory that belongs to someone else. The picture is still there. And what's more, if you go there, you who never was there, if you go there and stand in the place where it was, it will happen again. Because even though it's over, over and done with, it's going to always be there waiting for you." Close quotes. The last one is from A Paragon by Colin McCann. Quote, it slowly dawned on Bassam that the only thing they had in common was that both sides at once wanted to kill people they did not know. When he said this, a ripple of ascent went around the table, a slow nodding of heads, a further loosening. A shiver went among them. My wife, Salwa, my daughter, Abir, my son, Mohammed. Then from across the table, my daughter, Rachel, my father, Haim, my uncle, Yosef. But some wondered how he had ignored this for so long. They too had families, histories, shadows. It will not be over until we talk. 27 years ago, at the end of the archival research on studies on perpetrators, I returned home with my eight year old son after spending a year at Harvard's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences on a dissertation research fellowship for my thesis on perpetrators of necklace murders. I booked my flight directly to the Eastern Cape city of East London, where my parents would have waited to receive us back home. But I wanted to land in Cape Town 
and spend a few days in the city and its beautiful Table Mountain and coastal sites. Having cast my absentee votes at the Boston State House in the first all race elections in South Africa, and with the privilege of having been the first to do so among South Africans, I was returning home as a full citizen with hopeful excitement, driving from Cape Town International Airport on the way to our hotel in Sea Point. I made a detour to Langa, the township where I grew up. I drove up Brinton Street and parked in front of, my, of, of our house, number 69 Brinton Street. I wanted to get a visual perspective of Table Mountain and its distance. It was a bright sunny day, one of those lovely Cape Town winter days in early June. The mountain is clearly visible in all its majestic wonder. Yet when people I met in the US spoke excitedly about Cape Town and this iconic Table Mountain, I had no memory of actually seeing it and experiencing this sense of its iconic beauty that everyone was talking about. I knew it's there, of course, it was more than distance that shut out this view of one of the most iconic symbols of the beauty of Cape Town. The nearness to the experience of erasure of people as citizens all around me when I was growing up was the main cause of this distance. I was back in Cape Town to reclaim that missed moment. The following year, at the end of 95, I put my doctoral work away for a few years to join the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And now I'm involved in exploring, reflecting on the question, why my country, where my country is now in relation to the future of that original hopeful vision of the TRC. How does the current inequality, the current violence, not just the physical violence, but also the violence of racism and of the everyday acts of marginalization reflect on that moment of South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy? How might the affective moments of TRC public testimonies and the TRC as a memorial space of bearing witness to collective pain speak to the current social and political moment in South Africa? How might the arts help to create a culture in which encounters between subjects are inspired by the politics of care and inspire citizens to care for others enough to act, to act ethically and responsibly toward them? Addressing these questions requires reflecting on the TRC and that moment as a moment of transition with all that was necessary in the process of transition. Clearly, there were certain things that should have been done during the TRC, certain missed moments and certain things that should have been done but were not done after the TRC. These problem cast a shadow on South Africa's faltering vision of democracy and they have contributed to the majestic grief that continues to haunt families and communities for whom the TRC process did not provide answers. I return to the archive of the TRC, not to try to resolve questions of the unfinished business of the TRC. A return to the TRC testimony, however, is, an act, is in an act of looking back and seeing it with fresh eyes to quote unquote, revision the archive in Adrian Rich's parlance, as if rereading an old text. Catherine Cole in her excellent portrayal of what she refers to as the performance of the TRC is one of the few scholars who advocate for the re-examination of TRC testimonies. I want to begin with a discussion of the opening moments of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The first of the three, three epigraphs I read at the start of my paper from Tsitsi Dangaremga, Unmournable Bodies, suggests that although the women in her book may have escaped and left the violence of past wars, 
The violence resists banishment to the past. It has left an indelible imprint and is felt at the most intimate level of their bodies and expressed through the narratives that draw them effectively and, ex and, and within the community with one another. I'll say more about this later, but for now, let me point out that this observation in the op epigraph of long buried traumatic memory exploding, resisting, silencing, resonates with our experience when we first went out to community to speak to communities to speak about the truth commission. I had designed what at the time we called the TRC outreach program, an informational process that, are, that was rolled out nationally in South Africa. Now the first photo uh, that we are going to show now is a meeting at this community. It's an informational meeting in this hall. We can see, as you can see here, the halls were always packed with people wanting to tell their stories, even before the TRC hearing started. Every one of the people in this room had a story to tell. And it seemed that for many of them, it did not matter that these meetings were not actual hearings. They rose from their seats, sometimes weeping, laying their grief bare, pleading, angry, demanding to know why he was killed, by whom, where did they bury her? What did we do to deserve this? When the TRC public hearings opened for the first time, the aesthetics of the visually striking hall seemed to hold at once the tension between the symbols of pain and suffering and the promise of renewal. When the audience rose to sing a song that was at once a poem and an anthem and a lament for the oppressed at these hearings sung throughout the years of apartheid repression by black people at mass funerals, political rallies, and peaceful pro protests. The song, Liza Lisi Dingala Kongosi, Fulfill Your Promise, Lord, reverberated into the large hall, carrying the hope that the moment promised. The TRC served a narrative function that went beyond individual victims' testimonies. And the songs sung at the TRC hearings established an effective and aesthetic thread that connected witnesses and united them in their collective retelling of history in a shared national event. Some scholars criticize the TRC for being religious. However, the, 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 the error that these critics make is that is understanding that over the years of apartheid struggle, the songs took on a new meaning in the lives of Black South Africans, meanings that went beyond the religious messaging in the songs. For instance, this song that opened the TRC hearings, Lisa Lisi Dingalako, was sung at the opening of the inaugural conference of the African National Congress in 1912. Far from being simply religious songs, these songs are repositories of historical memory through which the struggles, hopes, triumphs, and disappointments that witnesses had faced can be traced. You could feel the electrifying mood at these hearings when the songs were sung. The hope was there for sure, but it was not without the threats of betrayal and disappointment hovering over the public hearings. This song of hope coexisted at the TRC with songs of despair an example is when Archbishop Tutu broke into a song when witnesses heart-wrenching testimony with another, uh, with, an, with another, so he broke into another song when, when, he, when someone broke down in tears in the midst of a testimony. The song is Senzenina. Archbishop Tutu was invoking a language that is culturally understood. There was something enigmatic about this moment, as we spoke to, to singing, Senzenina, what have we done? With the audience spontaneously following in unison, a reminder of the strong intergenerational connection between Tutu's 
own relentless struggle against violence and the stories of pain and suffering recounted in the hall. His singing of the song was itself a witness testimony, a wailing cry whose resonance was a force that should have, been woke, should have woken us up to another truth, that the wordlessness of the screams at the TRC and the mournful sound of a song connected three generations of struggle. It symbolized an abiding framework, not only of a shared memory of the past, but also the telescoping of this past back to the past and across generations into the future. It symbolized a presencing of the future at the moment of testimony, presenting us with the possibility of looking at trauma, not as a repetition of the past, but its continuity. The communal ritual of spontaneous singing of a mournful song is a time honored response in this cultural context. It is also an invitation to share in the suffering of others. Individual narratives of experiences at the TRC carried an extra weight because they went beyond the individual to capture a larger story of collective trauma. These songs became a vehicle for opening the space for historical reflection and the translation of these shared emotive moments into important sources of history. My point goes more to the observation posited by W.E.B. Du Bois, who calls the quote unquote, heart touching witness of African American spiritual songs, sorrow songs, and concludes that the sorrow songs carry a vision of hope, yet the songs are not without the shadow of fear hanging over them. They are the music of people, quote, who, quote, tell of death and suffering and unvoiced longing toward a truer world of misty wanderings, hidden ways and hidden ways. Du Bois's sorrow songs extends my own thinking about trauma in this project about its expression at a collective level, what and how we, presu we presume it is repeated or transmitted and how traumatic memory becomes translated into different languages in subsequent generations. In this sense then, I see the TRC and all the dramas that unfolded in it in different languages of trauma, the musical, effective, embodied and verbal performative languages. Looking at the TRC as an important memorial site to explore trauma beyond the personal and beyond the, per the perception of its location, or as has been argued in trauma theory, its missed location in the mind. I now want to share a glimpse of some of the work that I want to do with TRC testimonies. In my own work, in my work, I have discussed trauma as a rupture. And here in this project, I want to suggest first that trauma's assimilation does not only happen in the mind. It happens also in other areas of one's subjectivity, including the body, the culture and the multi-subjective engagements that ensue in the meaning making of these traumatic experiences. Furthermore, and more importantly, in reading TRC testimony as text, as I suggested earlier in the paper, I propose an alternative temporal structure of trauma rather than the view of trauma as the quote unquote, return of the past, that references a particular moment in the past, I will argue that trauma's return is a more ambiguous space that points backwards, not just to a single traumatic event. It points to multiple generational pasts and forwards in a prophetic foretelling of traumatic violence to recur in the future. Central to this discussion will be the 
to articulate the ways in which the emotional intensity of the performance of traumatic memory in the TRC testimonies reflects an aesthetic quality that points to the impossibility of healing from the past. The scream that Archbishop Tutu was responding to with song are screams that were iconic. One of these is a scream by Nomonde Kalata. It's a very well-known moment at the TRC and the moment that Archbishop Tutu described as the moment that marks the beginning of the Truth Commission. Nomonde's husband was killed with, her, with his uh, comrades by apartheid security police. Their bodies were burnt and left in a felt outside of one of the Eastern Cape towns. They were discovered several days after they'd gone missing. I read Nomonde's scream at the Truth Commission as a prophetic moment, an interruption of the vision of reconciliation right at the start of the TRC process, a moment that seems to foretell the tragedy that must continue. Not only is the past not past, it is the future that looms on the horizon. As an interruption, her cry announces its presence in this history and reclaims its place in it. The ways that Mrs. Kalata describes the enduring imprint of, imprint of the trauma of her loss as a tearing apart of my heart is worth noting. She describes the moment at the tear of that discovery of what happened to her, of the husband's body, as a moment that tore her heart apart. And she says in a film that was made by her son, who was five years old when her, his father died, to kazuka in my language is to tear apart. And it's an ir irreparable tearing apart. When you say something, you mean it's torn. You can fix it, but the mark will remain there. So the state of being torn, of one's heart being ripped apart, the language of trauma in other ways than the Greek origins of the word wound and its medical meaning in trauma theory. I'm suggesting here that this is suggesting a different way, an alternative way of understanding the language of trauma and what happens during trauma. I found useful insights from several scholars. Rebecca Schneider, for instance, thinks about, uh, explores movement and the gestural as a body-to-body -body transmittance of affect and memory, which reverberates beyond the performance itself. There is a strong resonance here with the notion of transgenerational tra continuity and how through testimony, the body becomes the link between memory and place across generations in much the same way that is portrayed in the epitaph from Tom Toni Morrison's text. Here then in the following, is, a, is this short three minute video clip that I want to share with you, which shows scenes from the TRC, which I consider to be emblematic of this possibility to think about the place of the body in trauma. This is a, a clip from Mark Kaplan's film between Joyce and Remembrance. Joyce and Tim Kulu's son was captured, uh, um, abducted, tortured, uh, killed, poisoned, and, and killed slowly by the poison, and then abducted again. And he was murdered, and his body was buried in some place that was never discovered until seven years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission ended its amnesty hearings. So we will show the, uh, the film now. But for the sake of content warning, Toward the end of the three minutes, there is a loud bang, but the bloody effects of this scene have been kept at a minimum. If I can say anything in front of the Truth Commission, I am pleading to it to ask these chaps to tell me or us what they did to Spew and why they did it. How? 
Where are Spiro's bones? What are they going to do? If somebody has a severe neurological damage and abdominal pain, and they've been in prison, then one suspects some toxin has been administered. We then uh, asked the nursing staff to get us some hair out by the roots. And the patient said, but you don't need to pull it out. Look at it, it's lying on the pillow, it's falling out. And that was the clue to the poison being thallium. This is Spiro's hair. This is the scalp attached to the hair. I want the commission to witness the effect of the poison which was used to my son. With no resistance whatsoever, that I can promise you. They were actually quite relaxed. I don't know what went through their minds. I cannot know that. What did they do while you went outside and collected the firewood you were going to use to burn them? General Farensberg and I collected firewood and then Colonel Duplessis would look after them. And as they were burning there, by the way, you said for how long was it? I think approximately six hours is what I said. I think that's what I said. That thing, it really, really changed my lifestyle. Because I, I'm not as kumbuzo that people used to know before. After that commission, just my life, it just went miserable. But I never used no physical uh, method on, on Sapio. That I can tell you with, with the truth here tonight. I think we might we we we, we made it. He's sitting there by his house and showing himself with his kids. You see, what about us here? Yeah? This story of Skumbuzom Timkulu and his encounter with the man who murdered his father illustrates for us a moment of reflection or offers us a moment of reflection on the question of what transgenerational trauma means in the South African context with the history of these crimes. I'm skipping a section here where I engage in dialogue with a dear friend, Marian Hirsch's notion of post-memory. In skipping that, I want to just end by saying, in, in that section, by saying that at this stage, uh, uh, th that at this stage of the maturity of the generation of these young men, such as Kumbuzom Tim Kulu, to characterize the experiences, their experiences, uh, in terms of the definition of post-memory that Marion Hirsch has advanced would be to deny the enduring structural reality faced by the younger generations in countries with centuries of violent histories of colonial oppression. The concept is a wonderful moment for us to engage in interdisciplinary reflection. And a shout out to Marion for opening up, up the space for us to start thinking about this. At this stage of the maturity of this generation in South Africa, however, and the generations before who traverse the colonial and the apartheid eras, how must, must we think about transgenerational transmission of trauma? Are we dealing with ghosts from the past, traumas imprints surviving, embodying, embodied and translated into different languages of trauma with each generation or the hope that will flourish at first, its flame flickering and then dying in future. 
these are some of the questions that I want to explore in my, in my projects. A problem that is often debated nowadays, but which I think has not received adequate scholarly attention is the denial of accountability by groups that have supported and benefited from oppressive regimes. So while we are concerned about what's going on with the current generation of descendants of victims of apartheid, we must also be concerned about what is happening to the generation of descendants of people who benefited from apartheid. And this is a problem, the problem of denial at the level of people who benefited from apartheid. It makes it difficult to imagine democratization and nation building in a way that had begun the conversation about the transition from apartheid to post-apartheid period. The reasons for refusal to acknowledge accountability is that these transitional processes tend to evade the historical context of crimes against humanity and focus too narrowly on individual perpetrators. This mode of reflecting on the past is perpetuated by the way the media reports on these crimes and making very little or no link between the crimes and the rest of the society that supported them. Dramatic scenes such as the one in the following image from the TRC, which shows the notorious torturer, Jeffrey Benzin, demonstrating the wet bed torture method, too often turned attention solely on the perpetrator. This photo of Benzin was asked, he, in this photo, he was asked by one of his, uh, of his victims to show the audience how you did it. He himself wanted to see how did he do it and went on to interrogate him about what kind of a person he is to do such a, to commit such a crime. The contribution that perpetrators and communities of beneficiaries can make in processes of redress and reckoning with the past begins with acknowledgement of how they are implicated in these violent histories. The project of reconciliation begins with articulation and acknowledgement of what it is that is being reckoned with and reflecting on how different groups are positioned in relation to this past. This is why I think remorse is important. When remorse emerges as part of reckoning with a violent and oppressive past, it offers an important shift that allows the flourishing of a profoundly new politics of engagement with the past. My aim in this, in this final section of my work will be to elaborate on the process of remorse and to show how it is linked to the broader community, it's how it's important is linked to the broader community. I also want to deal in this section with the arts as a language that can help us to deal with the remains of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or the remains of the unfinished business of the TRC. In the shadows of the pandemic, when individual and collective mourning fails, the remains of this unfinished business of unacknowledged and still denied past violations of human rights have been brought into sharper focus. And for this reason, I believe the arts has never been more important. To conclude, I would like to illustrate this possibility, the potential for the arts to restore a sense of social solidarity in societies such as ours with a short one minute clip from Philip Miller's music that he created from the TRC testimonies titled Rewind, a cantata for voice tape and testimony. Earlier, I referred to Mrs. Norman de Talata's testimony and her iconic scream at the opening of the TRC. In his rewind, Philip Miller, Miller reproduces Mrs. Talata's scream as a seamless repetition that reverberates like a repetitious tearing apart that must be witnessed as history. Translating Mrs. Talata's cry into a music piece 
invites engagement with it and for audiences to feel with her, not to appropriate her feelings, but to reconnect with our own and to confront the various ways which we are touched by which we are touched by this past to bear the weight in other words. In my work, I use the word in Kosa, which is which means to carry the burden, the burden of, of others, the burden that you are responsible for. These words, both in terms of their onomatopoetic sound and in terms of just their meaning, they are such strong words that I wish you could insert them in the English language because they're so powerful. They catch, capture the imagination. So this idea of using the arts to inspire empathy among people is among people in, in countries that have been affected by this history is a very important uh, a, a vehicle for us to engage in dialogue. To rewind, which is the name of Philip Miller's uh, um, uh, video, to rewind is to turn back in order to start again. One may hear the same thing or hear what one did not hear before, or it may be to start anew to produce a different outcome, the possibility of empathy in the face of impossible repair. Thank you. Monde Galata. Monde Calata. Thank you, uh, Humla. Um, thank you very much uh, for the talk. There are a few questions that are, I think are important. So um, one is, uh, how much progress has South Africa made uh, so far? And what do you attribute the uh, lack of progress towards equality that um, is still an issue? One of the problems is, a big problem, is the problem of corruption in South Africa it's reached phenomenal levels that every time we read about what's going on, it's unbelievable. It's just beyond human understanding. So that's one. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason that white South Africans are not willing to, and the majority of them are not willing to engage and to open up the space for dialogue about how to build South Africa together is that they look at the black government and, 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 and complain that what is the point of a government that is enriching itself? And it's not untrue, it is very true. So one very important problem in South Africa is that of corruption. The other one is that the wealth that was, was created during apartheid was very skewed in favor of white people. And so as we move into the next generation, the inheritors of that wealth are still today mostly white people. And black people have inherited poverty, they've inherited disability, they, they've inherited um, loss of, of, of privileges, they, they have no privileges. And so 
the inequality is a continuity from the past, from apartheid, but it's also a consequence of the failure, of drastic failure of our government, particularly under Jacob Zuma. Um, if we can move on from uh, South Africa to the rest of the world, there is a question about Palestine and Israel. Can the South African model of truth and reconciliation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work for other places like Palestine and Israel? You know, I really think that we, we cannot, these processes can't be replicated as they are. There are aspects of the commission that are important. For instance, what happens when people who have suffered trauma need to confront this history in the presence of people who can listen to what happened in the past. In other words, people need the question to be answered, what happened? What happened to my loved ones? For someone to listen to that story of what happened. Often when people have suffered trauma, one of the problems uh, that exacerbates the trauma is the inability to speak their pain. And these processes allow people to speak their pain. But most importantly, there must be people, others who listen and who take responsibility for what happened in the past. And so if those aspects of the TRC can be drawn and some aspects of this work, you know, to begin engaging in conversations uh, in these countries, then it is not going to solve the problems, but it begins to open up the space for people to start talking to one another and for people to start at least experiencing some vestiges, some sense of healing. Mm. In, in, uh, in Palestine and Israel, for instance, there is a group of people who are called the Parents Circle. They've come to South Africa to learn about the, tier, the reconciliation process. So there's something to learn from it. But, and, and they've taken it back to work to build the parent circle, the founders of the parent circle came to the commission. Many years ago, when the truth commission started, when it was still the flavor of the month, there were people from many parts of the world who came to, to, to experience what happened in the commission. Congressman John Lewis, the late John Lewis, before they commenced the pilgrimage that uh, is, has gone on for, I think, more than 15 years, the march across Selma Bridge. They came with a group of Congress people to speak to us, to reflect on what the value of the commission is and what lessons they can learn to build that structure that they, they, they founded to start the pilgrimage and, and, and across uh, um, the Selma Bridge. There are many examples, uh, the Greensboro Truth Commission in the US, although most people say it was not wholly successful, they drew from the Truth Commission. So there are lessons, there are insights to be drawn from it, although it cannot be replicated. One insight I think is important is for people to know that the TRC, there were things that could have been done that were not done at the Truth Commission. Um, and, and so those lessons are also as important as the positive lessons. Mm. Um, a follow-up question of, to what you, you are saying, how does one navigate not only a post-memory trauma, but one that is ongoing caused by violent acts committed by a post-apartheid post state? Sorry, I missed the first part. What, so what's... How, how does one navigate not only a post-memory trauma, mm -hmm. but one that is actually ongoing and committed mm -hmm. by a post apartheid state? Mm -hmm. You know, this is such an important question. Um, we, so there are crimes that, especially now with the pandemic, we've seen it so clearly. We, 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 we've seen it even before, but we've seen it so clearly. And what seems to be happening is that the repetition is happening at the level of the translation of the power structures that operated during apartheid under the police, for instance. There is a, a lack of reflection on what it means to be a citizen in post-apartheid South Africa. So some of those lessons, quote unquote, lessons from apartheid South Africa of superiority of some people and inferiority of others, 
they've been they've been they have been used by not only by the state but by ordinary South Africans. Just recently, we have a story last week of a school principal putting a little boy through a pit toilet, through all the murk of the pit toilet because his phone was dropped in the toilet. And he tied this, bo this boy in a, in, a, in a rope and lowered him into a pit toilet and forced him to search for his, for his phone in the pit toilet. Now, they, in this story, the race register is not, is not there but the, the power dynamics of someone who is an older person, who is a person of authority is imposed on this little boy, almost as if, you know, reenacting, but in a different way, reenacting the oppressive kind of way of treating people who are inferior or perceived to be inferior. So this is, this is a, a very important pro pro question and it's a problem in our country. And part of, of the reason that it, it persists is because during the transition, there was no moment of actually engaging into what does it mean to be human in a post-apartheid South Africa. All the political processes were in place. All of you know, what was needed, what needed to be done was done. But the most important thing, which was to engage as citizens in society from the police to businesses, all the institution, educational institutions, a conversation about how do we embrace the policies that are really great policies. South Africa has been loaded for having the most progressive constitution. It's not only the, in the constitution, but also policies of human rights. Everything is in place. You know, there are, there are policies to protect women, but in practice, it's just not happening. So there needs to be a realignment of that commit, you know, with that commitment uh, in, in a not kind of a, another truth commission, as it were, in a conversation that people will be call, called to order and ref, for, for them to reflect on what it means to be a citizen in a new South Africa, embracing these new values of social solidarity. Um, there is a question about uh, what is the composer and the title of the music that we played, which is followed by a question about the last part of your presentation, uh, stressing the importance of the arts in dealing with historical trauma and inspire empathy. And um, this uh, person uh, asked, can you say more about the role of arts? Yes, I would be happy to say more about the role of arts. I'm also watching the time, but let me just say the following that um, arts stands in the place of language. Language so often alienates people. When you bring people together, words are used such as, you know, you, are, you should be ashamed, you should be guilty, uh, you're a perpetrator, you're a victim. Art stands in the place of words. And arts, by its very presence, inspired aesthetic responses that begin with the aesthetic responses, and then the words follow afterwards. For instance, I use this piece, uh, Philip Miller's piece, as a way of showing the possibility that when when people listening to that voice, to Namonde's cry, there is always this possibility that they are listening to it. As for instance, if you're a woman, you are listening to it as a pain that affects another woman or a pain that affects another person. And so the response initially is to that. And then in the course of engagement, then art should not be left, you know, should not be done and left, you know, in, 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 in exhibitions. There should be constant engagement with the arts. And, and I think that um, we, we are still at an early stage of actually thinking about what it is that arts does, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, uh, overestimate the role of the arts and imagine that it will solve all, all our problems. But it does open the space for a different kind of conversation, for new narratives to emerge, new connections between people who are affected by these histories. That is the power of the arts. We witnessed that during apartheid, and I think we can, we can still use that. 
and these these um, works by Philip Miller. It's called Rewind, by the way. Philip Philip Miller Rewind, uh, um, cantata for voice um, uh, uh, and testimony. There's something else, but you will find it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Kumla. Thank you for your important presentation and insightful perspectives. I also want to thank you, our audience, for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for, uh, for other Radcliffe virtual programs. You can find out about more programs and watch videos of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>